Welcome to Cyrus Forum. My name is Mariam Mamar Sadegi, and my guest today is Ladana Burmand. Ladana Burmand uh, needs no introduction, uh, not to the Iranian community or to the global democracy community, but just a few words about all that she's done. She's co founder of the Abdul Rahman Burmand Foundation. Um, whose work we will get into in this interview. Uh, she is a historian, um, a democracy activist, a former member of the steering committee of the World Movement for Democracy, and a 2009 recipient of the Lec Valenza Human Rights Award. Um, I have the honor and privilege of having been friends with Ladan Buraman for many years. Uh, she has always been an inspiration and a very kind mentor to me. Um, so with that note of thanks and gratitude, uh, Ladan John, Kharame uh, Buraman, uh, welcome. Thank you so much and thank you for having me, Mariam John. Um, Ladan John, let me uh, start by asking you to say a bit about um, what you've done at the Buriman Foundation, and let me link that uh, to the Cyrus Forum. The Cyrus Forum is going to be building uh, strategic readiness, preparedness, uh, capacity for Iran's transition away from tyranny, and the day after regime change or overthrow or collapse is our focus. And the work that you have done at the Abdul Rahman Buriman Foundation is absolutely critical because you have been for decades now documenting uh, human rights abuses by the current regime, specifically the killing of people, executions, uh, terror attacks, um, assassinations, and uh, other ways of killing uh, innocents. Um, how do you see the work that you have done as important to democratic transition in Iran? Thank you. This is a very uh, good question, uh, Mariam John. The, the very reason, raison d'etre, of this uh, organization and the project, Omid Memorial, and the documentation uh, is for the transition. Um, because uh, we were the young people in 1978, 1979, and we realized um, how. Um, the new regime, totalitarian regime, used the transition mechanism to strengthen its totalitarian rule. And we realized that if there is, if there is to be a next uh, opportunity, we need to be prepared to have a transition that will lead us and help us strengthen democratic institutions. And since the truth is the first victim of all totalitarian regime, we thought that we should start document the truth uh, about the violation of the rights of human beings by the system and have it somewhere that it's accessible by everyone and there would be no possibility for any agreement uh, despite or in spite of the truth. It sh is, and ordinary people and the public will have access to it in order to hold everyone accountable. So this is why we started to document um, a human rights violation. And our hope was that um, this compilation will help uh, truth possible potential truth commission or transitional justice mechanism. Uh, it will uh, facilitate their work because they will have something to work on to begin with. They, they won't have to begin from scratch, which is really um, a, a long, tedious work. That's why we started this work. Excellent. Uh, so, what does the Omid Memorial do exactly, and, and and how much have you documented? Well, we have around the uh, Omid Memorial is a very, um, uh, um, you know, it's a very um, labor-intensive work uh, because we, when we document, just to give you an example, because we want to do um, analysis of state violence over the years. When we enter 
one case is not one name, one case. Behind the story you see on Omid Memorial, there is um, a database which contains every single document related to this case, be it uh, newspaper uh, information, be it police information, be it um, interview with the families or the relatives, and then who entered it, at what time, at what date we acquired this or that document. So there is an, um, a very um, um, complete work Mm -hmm. behind it, which makes our work very slow. So we have 26,000 uh, cases more or less documented in uh, in Omid Memorial, but we have thousands of files that have not been processed. And since we do this, we have an educational purpose at the same time, the way we, um, we structure the narrative about each case is based on due process of law so that the reader will unconsciously go through the uh, supposed um, the, you know, stages of due process and realize that they haven't been uh, respected. And then next to it, we have all the human rights that have been violated, singled out. So if they click, when they click on it, they will be familiarized with the, the rights that have been violated in this particular case. And there is also a background about the judiciary within which this case took place and was uh, processed. So it's uh, it's a resource for victims, for the public, for journalists, for scholars, for jurists. Uh, it's a very ambitious work. That's why it takes so much time. And it's right. bilingual. And it's bilingual. Yeah, so this documentation um, is for, for obvious reasons, which you have uh, outlined, going to be instrumental to a transitional justice process in Iran, also a process to transform the judiciary from what it is currently to a judiciary that is truly independent um, and in pursuit of justice rather than really being a tool of, of repression and injustice. Um, how do you foresee um, after transition away from the current um, regime or in the process of transition, how do you see uh, leading political figures or uh, human rights practitioners in Iran using the work that you have done to facilitate transitional justice? Well, I, my hope, our hope, um, uh, Roya and us and all our team at ABF, our hope is that if we have a transition and um, a transitional justice mechanism is set up, we will provide them with this information so that they could both contextualize the cases they are uh, working on and also uh, find uh, document, documents and information which will, you know, shorten their uh, the you know the the amount of work that they have they need to put in each work and we have seen an example of the use of our work um, in the recent uh, trial of uh, Hamid Nouri mm -hmm. who was um, charged with um, crime uh, and was uh, tried under universal jurisdiction in Sweden uh, using our own archives and reaching out to the survivors of a very precise crime, the massacre of political prisoners in 1988, we commissioned a legal um, expert to analyze and qualify this crime. And we published his analysis. And this analysis was very useful in, you know, was used by a plaintiff in order to rapidly draft a complaint and have the man arrested. This was the first time that uh, we thought we saw a, a judicial uh, outcome of our work. But, um, you know, even if there is no judicial um, um, institutions to address this issue, the issue, all the, the injustice of the Islamic Republic, the the database has also a vocation for historic justice. 
And short of real judicial justice, historic justice can play a very major role in smoothing the transition and in allowing the victim's uh, plight to be collectively acknowledged by the society. Be because this is a, a sine qua non of a healthy transition to a democratic system. Is for the people to know the truth about what's happened. Yes, and uh, for the victims to realize that their own society, their fellow citizens, acknowledge the harm done to them. This is very important to reconstruct the social fabric based on solidarity and acknowledgement of the, um, the injustice done to our fellow citizens. And this also we have seen some, you know, example of its impact, psycho psych psychosocial impact of it. You know, victims sometimes they are very depressed. So they type their loved one's name out of the blue in the internet search engine, and then a, they fall upon a story, the story of their um, aunt or uncle told in Omid Memorial by people who never knew th their aunt. And this changes their perspective. All of a sudden, the, you know, the hopeless situation become a little brighter because they realize that there are a few people they have never met, they don't know, they don't know where they are, who they are, who have cared for their loved one and made sure that their memory is um, kept and the injustice done to them is acknowledged. And also in a collective sense, how much the people of Iran have in common in that almost every family has been touched by uh, the injustices of the regime, and particularly the killing of, of innocents. It, 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 it brings people together in a way, right? Yes, it is. And of course, there are many forms of injustice. We, we just, because of, you know, we are a tiny organization, we opted for the gravest, which is the um, assault on life right. and the right to life. But, uh, you know, people have, ha on a daily basis, they are going through so many uh, injustices, flogging. So many young people have been um, flogged or, or spoliation of property or, you know, denial of justice on every level, harassment by the police. All of this, I mean, we, need, we will need in the future a, a very big state institution to study uh, past state violence. Yeah. But this is a symbolic um, action that we have uh, we have started. Very significant. And my hope is that as Cyrus Forum develops, we will be able to have more conversations with you. And um, you've been gracious enough to serve as an advisor uh, to Cyrus Forum. Um, so at this point, just one last question. Um, and there will be an interview with you with, that is more extensive uh, in Persian also. Um, you've been doing this for a long time. And, and in fact, you, you started a focus on human rights before the revolution, it, uh, even though you were very young. Um, through the years, how have you seen the people of Iran evolve? Uh, what are the positive things you're seeing? And what are some of the things that make you uh, not so not so optimistic. First, let's start with the negative and end on the positive. Um, let me start with the, um, the positive and worry about potential negative. Sure. Because, because in the last 20 years, most of the, um, the changes I have noticed were positive. Let me bring you, you weren't, I guess you weren't born. Um, in 1978 or 1970, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, in, 19, in 1977, I think, or 78, I don't remember exactly, the first Iran human rights organization was established. But when you look at the work that was done, first of all, basically, it was kind of a front for political goals. Um, and what was this? What, sorry? What group was this? That was basically um, the National Liberation Movement, Bazargan, uh, Engineer Bazargan, 
and also a few uh, members of the National Front. Um, basically, the li religious liberal and secular nationalist liberal who uh, not being able to work together politically, they, they decided to work together on a platform of human rights. But when you see the reports at the time, is there are so much disinformation and they have instrument they were instrumental i mean shamelessly instrumentalizing uh human rights as a political tool uh to reach their political goals what has changed and in the early 19 1980s i think we were the only people who started uh, to talk about human rights in a, a non-partisan way even if we were uh, members of the Shapur Bakhtiar organization, uh, the, the last prime minister of Iran, uh, the social democratic pro-democracy activist, we started to defend the rights of um, all our adversaries, um, the revolutionary left, the Islamic, the communist, whoever, the ancien regime, um, and we were the only ones at the time. Um, now, to, to, for you to see how things have changed in the last in the last 20 years the new generation is completely based on the real human rights not on politicized human rights and um, civil society organization human rights organization they have all sprang up uh, and doing a work that is remarkable and is based on non-political defense of human rights. An example that I would say, the Baha'i issues was never highlighted. Yeah. We were, I think as an Iranian organization created by Muslim-born um, um, citizens, we were the first who brought the Baha'i issues, except the Baha'is themselves, and the homosexuals issues into the limelight. Today, I mean, even in Iran in 2009, young people were addressing all these mullahs talking about gay rights, about Baha'is rights, about the equal rights to education and so on. The cultural fabric of Iran has changed or changed for the better in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. Now, what I'm worried is that um, sometimes well, this is m among the educated university uh, graduate that um, started to, to work on human rights. I see that in a more popular level, mm -hmm. the anger of um, the violence of the regime, the killings and so on, sometimes is so much that even activists are intimidated by this anger and sometimes the notion of vengeance and the notion there is a confusion between the notion of uh, vengeance uh, and the notion of justice and this is where i'm a little bit worried for the future because um, the regime is very violent and that creates a lot of anger and for having been through this emotional experience of losing a loved one yeah. into state violence, I have, exp I have experienced in my own being the capacity of killing someone after this uh, experience. So I know that we need to tame this anger and to direct it towards democratic, justice seeking uh, process. And this is the only thing that for now worries me. Thank you so much, Ladena Buruman. As I mentioned, we will take more of your time, uh, more discussions like this. I'm so grateful to you.